Recording has begun. Uh, today is September 27th, the night of the supermoon. And uh, I haven't had it, you know, I haven't had a chance to really, it's pretty cloudy out here in the New York area. So uh, I haven't had a chance to re uh, see the eclipse of the supermoon or whatever the red moon is. Um, but um, September 27th, 2015, it's 7.31 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is an advanced uh, coaching session, Clueless 8, Frank, full disclosure. This is purely for financial education and not for any solicitation or advice. Just want to be very clear about that. For the newer people who are joining in, we are going to be doing uh, screen sharing. We're going to be exchanging. Uh, uh, I'll be basically transmitting what I think uh, might be going on and covering quite a few details. So let's start. What you see in the back right now is the actual futures in motion. Futures are down about eight and a half points. You can see that right there, right there. This is a good thing. Looks like Thinkorswim has changed their format a little bit. And uh, the colors should be more bright red, but, um, you know, they have that pinkish look on it. So maybe, you know, they're trying to make people happy. But um, this is what we're seeing live in action at uh, as the futures have started rolling in the global markets. A couple of important things. Let me start off with a broader picture. This... Um, and first of all, the administrative stuff. For especially for the new people, and the old ones have heard that many times from me, it is extremely important that you follow and read as much as you can, and of course study the charts on the Twitter real-time feed. That is my conduit for delivering information, and it is extremely important that you that you um, track that in order to understand the storyline. Uh, guys, uh, somebody has a lot of feedback, so if you could please uh, mute the mic. I can actually do it from this side. Okay, everyone can still hear me? Okay, great. Um, I just mute, mute the mic for everyone from this end. Um, I'll leave uh, the last section for questions. So let me get back on track. So administrative stuff, very important that you read the Twitter feed. My service is a little bit uh, of, a, of a learning curve. Some people catch it quicker. Some people, it takes a little longer, but it's really not that difficult. It is important to read what I'm putting across because the only communication device that I have is basically what I'm typing on my keyboard. So it is important that you all um, try to follow as much as possible. When it comes to the chat room, it is also important that sometimes um, you need to scroll back a little bit and see what I'm saying. I have no problem repeating myself here and there, but given the fact that I am executing multiple functions, as in trade alerts, monitoring markets, putting up charts, and uh, a very comprehensive uh, 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 content that's coming out to help and benefit uh, the members, it is important that uh, I don't put myself in a position to constantly repeat myself on simple stuff. So it's important that you guys read what I'm putting across. That's number one. Number two, the video casts that I put through time to time are also things that you should click and, uh, and, and, and listen to because my service is not designed to just give one or two bits of information and just, you know, uh, make an assessment on what's going on. I like to give a comprehensive picture on what's going on. And it's not always easy because the market is not easy. And especially the markets that we're dealing with right now. So very important that people do that. So let's click on that's administrative stuff. Here is what I think broader picture, what's happening and what probably will take place going forward into the end of the month into October. We all know, it's common knowledge that October is a very turbulent month. Well, September has been a turbulent month. So it's been August. So it's nothing new. But October, generally speaking, from a money management perspective, is the end of the fiscal year for mutual funds. 
I don't have the exact number in my head, but the mutual fund industry is the 800 pound gorilla that has monies invested from mom and pop, pension funds, you name it, in the US financial stock markets. So, so when, when they are jostling around, adjusting their portfolios, selling, buying, doing all kinds of stuff from an accounting perspective, and just as a reminder, I started off my first uh, my career on the financial side, working at as an associate analyst at Putnam Investments in Boston. That's where I'm in school. So I saw a lot of these things. I learned a lot of the things as I was working my way up. Um, so October is very tricky, and the good news is, generally speaking, after a real whipsaw, which generally happens around the middle of the month. People who are old members know very well that it's always around the 15, give or take a few days, is when we get the real smackdowns in the market. Um, October tends to end up on a positive way. We don't know what's going to happen this year, but that is pretty much what the story is. So be prepared for that. Second thing is, this was last October, October 2014. Around the 15th of the month, this is when we hit the lows. And this is October we are entering at, at one point. I'll go, go into the forecast in a few minutes. So in my, um, one of the things that's completely changed about the market, and I'm basically, you know, just warning everyone, is that there are macro factors beyond our control that are whipsawing the market at a speed that the machines only know how fast they're driving. In other words, do not expect. I can certainly draw some, I mean, I will certainly walk people through the levels so they're prepared. So nothing comes as a surprise when you see the markets opening down 400 points, and it's happened quite often, and we have still managed to make money. Because being prepared for what the road ahead is, is extremely important as you're driving your own car so you're not falling off the cliff. So the roadmap is extremely important, guys, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And you have to be prepared for it. Do not expect a walk in the park. As I like to remind people, as my dad used to say, if you think life is difficult, then everything else becomes easy. Well, that is the God honest truth with the markets too. This is a difficult market. And yet on tactical trades, we get 2000% returns for the ones who actually did what they needed to do, which wasn't easy. Friday was a prime example. I expected based on my technical expertise that we were going to correct because things were overbought on, a, on an internal level. I kept on saying the one hour reset Please have your Twitter feed open in some window. So if you don't want to remind yourself. And it's exactly what happened. And it went berserk. Those S&P calls, just to remind people, and I'm going to go through the charts in a, in a bit later in the session, went from a low. My original entry was around six. Added more around three. Added more around two. They went to $25. That's $25. And that's not a joke. So the bottom line is that I think this might be it. Let me see. Now, these are the 1920s. Bear with me. Just to show you guys a picture. Can everyone see this? Okay. Just type in, you know, yes or, you know, whatever you want on the thing. So here was Friday. And I just want to show you guys because you might not have followed it. So blow your mind. But these things happen quite often. Don't have to play with that much money. Little gets very big. Very big. So Friday starts off here.
bear with me. I believe they were not the 1955s because I play a lot of other uh, series too. Ah, there we are. Okay. So just I'm just recapping a few things here, just so you're prepared for the stuff that happens. Remove all drawings. Perfect. So here we are on Friday. Which kicks off uh, Friday kicks off here, right there. 9.45, market opens. So initial buys are around this level. They go down to buck 25 after going up, after going up to about seven and change. Waited around, kept on adding a little bit, little bit. Okay, I'm not talking putting, you know, 20,000 bucks on a intraday option that's going to expire the same afternoon. That's stupidity, but you can definitely play with fractions of that. Buck 25 here, six dollars here, original purchase, bought a bit around these levels. Okay, run three, saw it drop. So, what does it really take to buy something at a buck 50? If I told you guys that I get that there was a stock at a buck 50, just listen very carefully. If I told you guys stock was at buck 50 and that something's going to happen, whatever the case may be, pile in and this thing is going to go to 25 dollars plus. Would you take a gamble? Yeah, because market and trading and investments are about speculation. Well, look what happened. You got the lows here, buck twenty-five. You got the average cost being bought around here, little bits at a time, and then you see the explosion. Wouldn't it be nice if you caught, let's say, from two bucks? Or three dollars to fifteen, that's four hundred percent. From here, and I'm taking two as a as a as a rounded number to twenty-four here is eleven hundred percent. Okay, eleven hundred percent in one day. Has it happened before that big? Not that big, but it's happened a few times when we have done these intraday stuff. Now, the reason I'm highlighting this is not to show that I'm some kind of genius because I'm certainly not. The reason I'm showing that is because I stuck to my discipline of that one hour reset that I'm going to show you right now that took place right here. On Friday, Bear with me one second, I'm trying to find it. Ah, let me go back one hour. We were overbought. We were overbought and we were looking to come down. This line was not turning up. It repeatedly kept on staying down despite the fact that the market was basically jostling around. Remember, these put the prices of the puts dropping on Friday here. I should actually show you a closer picture. Yeah, that doesn't do much. Okay, there you go. So the prices of the puts, you know, with the stochastics being that overbought, there was no way possible that I was going to push myself to go on the long side. Because one way or the other, this line was going to reset. And that's exactly what it did. Now. The reason I'm mentioning this to everyone is because a good number of my trades, and this is just one of the things that I'm looking at, okay, that what we're going to cover tonight, relies on overbought, oversold conditions, both on the stochastics, MACDs, vortex indicators known as the VI, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm looking at at the same time. Keep in mind that I am looking at almost 60 different indicators on multiple screens during the day and making an assessment based on my experience and my reading of the of of all the news that's hitting the wires what might happen forecasting is a game of probabilities it's not a game of certainty 
I know you guys have heard from me before and the new people are hearing for the first time. You, you assess your probabilities and you make a mental and mathematical deduction as to what, what the probability is on the upside or the downside, known as risk reward. It doesn't always work out on our time, but people who've been with me know very well that it always works out. So the question is, you have to manage your trades accordingly. Despite all that, we still get, whether on the long side or the short side, we get smacked. Because the timing and the algos and the high frequency trading programs manage to keep people at a nervous level, of, at a heightened nervous level, whether they're long or short. And it just seems like it's never going to end. There have been many cases where I have been tactically short and the market has gone against me for a good portion of the day or even overnight. And then next day, opens down 200 plus points. Case in point was right here on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, the market opened down. Actually, between Wednesday and Thursday. You can look it up on the Twitter feed. And that was exactly what the case was. On Thursday, I was long. Markets opened up big. What did we do? We sold. We sell gap opens. You sell gap opens. This is not a hope game. This is a tactical game. Sell gap opens. Sold it around here right there and the market opened down on the lower end of the scale right now i don't know what's going to how the market's going to open up tomorrow morning the futures are showing down nine doesn't mean much so we're going to assess what is going on now let me get straight to some macro factors here we have the we have a major risk factor that has been injected into the market and that is in the form of the speaker of the house john boehner resigning markets don't know about i mean the markets don't like uncertainty there are people who are bullish so they're basically saying hey the john the boehner uh, resignation is good because that means there's no imminent government shutdown okay good but then who's going to replace him and how much power will the hardcore right-wing element of the Republican, ultra-conservative element of the Republican Party have, which can hamper with a lot of stuff that's going on, specifically with the Fed. So if they come by and they manage to push through some real fiscal strict measures on government spending and things like that, I can assure you, this market's not going to like it one bit. So, hi, KJS, how are you? Um, so, bottom line is, this element of risk that has been injected in the market, the political risk, is not something you sneeze away that fast. September 30th, if they don't have a meeting on certain things about the, the, about the budget, they're going to force a government shutdown. Markets are going to be nervous ahead of that, in my opinion, because the market doesn't know. So when the market doesn't know something, it's not going to like it. So it's every little rally, every little technical move, which you're going to cover, is, in my opinion, going to get hit with a wave of selling. Number two, we have the european factor in play here the european factor being what happened in germany the volkswagen thing is not a simple thing almost 70 percent of german labor is involved in the auto industry so what kind of what kind of hit it took to german business confidence and consumer confidence we don't know yet it is certainly not a good thing. Credibility of companies in Germany are very, very high. 
we all know that Germans are very quality conscious. So the fact that something like this happened has been happening for a couple of years now with their tampering of the emission standards is something that is going to hit the German economy. And the sooner they, they get out there to repair it, the better it is for them and for their financial markets. So if Europe is tottering because the strongest uh, power in Europe, Germany, is getting hurt, then it is going to wash out on this side too. So that's number two. Number three is China. We are familiar with everything that's happening in China. We're familiar with the fact we know by now all the bad things that are happening. And despite the Chinese stimulus efforts, it is still, the Chinese markets are still haven't had, a way, haven't had a chance to really had a convincing rebound. So every data that's coming out on the China front, which normally comes out around 9 or 10 p.m. during the weekday, including tonight, I'm going to tell you what data comes out in a second, uh, is going to be interpreted and acted on, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to create more volatility. So you got... So you've got three major things on that side. You've got the fourth thing that's coming out, just so you know, has to do with U.S. corporate earnings. What the hit to the U.S. corporate earnings has been because of all this global slowdown, we don't know yet, and we are entering earnings season. The fourth quarter begins on October 1st. Warnings from companies and projections and things like that, companies announcing or pre-announcing, you know, uh, uh, pre-announcing shortfalls, is going to start in a couple of days. The markets are going to be somewhat nervous on that. There will be companies which will be huge winners, and we hope to be in them in order to you know, maximize our thing. Nike was a huge winner for um, Nike was a huge winner for um, the Clueless Aid members because I estimated that Nike's earnings were going to be good and went in for a trade. The calls were up 150% and the stock was up almost $11 at one point, or more than $11. So huge winner in the middle of a um, day that we actually made substantial amounts of money on the short side. So it's, you really have to be very stock specific. And there is no, you know, there's no telling which one will do what. So those are the things that are really driving the markets right now. Okay, on the macro side. So that's done. Let's look at a few technicals here, which are very important to keep in mind. Here is a chart of the of the S&P 500. This is the spies, and this is my read on it. We have a forget the volume side right now. Put this up. Everyone is with me so far. Yes? Okay, good. Is some of the stuff making sense? Okay, good. So let's take a chart, uh, look of the. Remember one thing here. I don't think the bull market's broken, but what do I really care? I am inherently bullish because I believe that the world is not yet ready for a long multi year global depression. We have ample liquidity central banks are very aware of what's happening around the world their liquefaction pumps as in the form of li of liquidity pumping uh qe in europe low interest rates in the us more qe uh, and infrastructure projects coming in the form of government intervention and and pumping money into the economy in china all that stuff is not conducive to a broad global recession. Recessions start happening when the liquidity swamp, in other words, when the central banks start to tighten on an accelerated basis. An accelerated basis means not like a little rate hike here and there, like we're probably going to get one in October. I'm talking about accelerated rate hikes where rates basically let's say for example the 10-year bond right now in the us which is the proxy for all interest rates that we deal with bank rates mortgage rates credit card rates you name it things that affect the real economy things that affect 
the U.S. consumer, which is basically more than 70% of the U.S. economy, the GDP. Remember that. So when the consumer backtracks, doesn't matter what corporations are doing, there's going to be a very negative effect. But the, com the consumer is still out there. So all these things are supporting it. So the 10-year bond, for example, right now is, is at 2.168%. I'm going to show you a bond chart in a minute. So 2.2%, even if it jumps up to 2.5% or even 3%, is not something that will materially dampen the U.S. economy and the, and the recovery. However, an acceleration, a sharp acceleration up, like we get those taper tantrums, which we got when the Fed took away QE, or rate tantrums when rates are moving too fast, are things that will affect the market. But the central bank in the U.S., at least in my estimation, is not going to embark on a fast rate hike. They are not in the business of shooting down the U.S. economy. So just remember that. So despite some very heavy short-term volatility, the overall picture on the market, which we'll see in a minute, is, I don't think, has changed yet. So let's be aware of that. So here we have a chart of an hourly chart, which goes back to August, you know, the lows in August 24, the flash crash, right there, and where we are. It looks very likely, and I'm giving you all scenarios here. It is a very high probability, given the way the markets have been acting, that we are going to test those lows. In other words, we're going to break down, and we're going to come here. The sooner and faster it happens, just so you guys know, and the uglier it is in the markets on those 24 to 48 hours when it's happening, the better off it is for the market to find a footing for the longs. These are very simple, precise charts, and I have a lot of charts out there for people to see. So this one, for example, if we break below 190 on the S&P, there is a high probability that this support, losing this support, is going to create an avalanche of selling. And given the nervousness and the panic in the market, we very well drop immediately to this level here, which is around 186, 187. We've tried to find some footing here. If the market really has a destination here, which I think it does, then this will be just rally attempts to sell into, play the bounce. I'll certainly try to help as much as possible. And so far, I've been pretty right in my forecast on the market. Then we're going to fall really quickly. A triple bottom, if it holds, is going to create a massive rally in the markets. A massive rally. Just the way we had a massive rally from here, within 24 hours, we were in it. Then a pullback, then a move up, another pullback, and then a sharp move up. These are all market structure patterns, multiple market structure patterns. Higher lows, sometimes lower lows, and then a move. Generally, it's a dragon bullish or W pattern. That's all you got to remember, the W patterns. This, in my opinion, the way things are panning out, I'm going to go through each one of these lines, is turning out to be a dragon bearish M. So let's be aware of that. And let me show you a couple of simple things here that everyone should be aware of. Number one, this is a confirmed head and shoulder. You have a head. You have a left shoulder. And if we rally hard, we have a right shoulder. So even if we do this, which is possible this week, we have a lot of Fed speakers, a lot of shorts. Remember, institutional shorts need to get blasted out. The algos and the high-frequency trading programs will hit large amounts of shorts that are hiding in one room. That's the nature of the business. So even if it pulls up here and overshoots, let's say, to the upper end of the triangle, which is 200, in my opinion, that's the maximum move. That's a lot of money, by the way. 
if you catch one of these moves. We have done it. And you have to be extremely disciplined and focused to catch these moves because they happen very quickly. So that's one scenario. However, this is the left shoulder, in my opinion. And it's a multiple top because the markets can't seem to get out over this. Went here, but this was the Fed day, by the way, which fooled everybody. And... Uh, And then we have, um, and then we, and, and uh, okay, so this is what's developing here. Sorry, I was losing my thought. So this is the right shoulder, somewhere here. This is the right shoulder. That creates, that will basically create the head and shoulder that's going to cause the market to drop. And at that point, remember, 190, 190 on the S&P 500 is part of the trading band. It's also the neckline. Okay, it's also the neckline. Once you break the neckline, it's very easy to fall below as stops are triggered and all kinds of big, you know. And you'll notice something because the market is a very manipulated beast that you'll see all kinds of negative news, not just from the media, but, you know, coming out from different fronts and will fall rather quickly. Testing this low is going to take some work on the part of the machines. In other words, they're not going to make it easy because it's for the bears, it is, it is just, what should I say? I mean, it's just to them, it's just like winning the lottery ticket. So the market's not going to make it easy. The E-minis, which were down about 10 points earlier on, are now down only six. By the time we spend this session, finish this session, we might be only down. Oh, it's only down four now, four and a quarter, five and a quarter. I'm watching it on the other side. Um, it could be positive. That's just the way it works. That's the bearish scenario. If, if, and when we do get down to these levels, ladies and gentlemen, buy hard. Because for at least 24 to 48 hours, if not less, you're going to see a very sharp bounce. The biggest money is made, because I've shown this to so many people so many times, is at the point of maximum fear. We have very limited to no retail involvement in the market. And everywhere where you turn around, it's negativity, 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 that everything is just falling apart. Take advantage of that. Be a contrarian. Doesn't mean you have to be happy. I don't like when traders get too happy because that means a lot of money is being invested into the markets and they are basically trying to just thinking that, okay, the upside is just way big, we're gonna make new highs. None of that stuff is gonna happen. We are in a trading band. And once we resolve that, in my opinion, sometime by October, we are going to basically get up to with these levels, and I'll show that in a second. So that's your downside scenario. Now, if you ask me, like, when it's going to happen, I don't know. But I know it's going to happen between, it most probably, and if it doesn't happen, great. But most probably it's going to happen between now and mid-October, where we test these lows. So that's pretty much given. On a short-term basis, and I'm keeping this simple tonight, you have the lower Bollinger, you have uh, you have the uh, acceleration band, so falling down here towards these levels, and, the, and, and, and uh, testing the lower arm of the triangle can create another surge. That itself plays out as a market structure. And a bunch of you guys know very well, Guru and everyone, mentioning a few names. This is a, this is a market structure low. Engaging the 34 and the 50-day moving average is almost standard procedure. That's the red line and the orange line. Orange line is the 34-day moving average. People who are new here, Jeremy Pester and Paris, you'll know when, I, uh, uh, when you listen to my um, beginner's coaching session, advanced coaching session, the two of them that are that I put up there for free for people to listen to. You can listen to some other ones too. Um, I'll tell you, they work like magic. They work like magnets. So the further you move away from these, uh, from the highway, this is the highway, the moving average is the highways, okay? The further you're moving away from it, then there is a mean reversion and it acts like a magnet. You go back and test it. That's called the short squeeze. The testing, in my opinion, in a downward sloping 
market is a chance to sell your longs and go short. However, if you go too short, we don't know whether or not it's going to break out and go here or whether or not it's going to hit the, the 50 day moving average and the 34 day moving average. This was a false breakout, right? Just, just looking at the charts and we made tons of money shorting that failure. So how do you read this? I always explain to people, and I'm going to say this on, uh, or for the sake of some of the newer people, that when you're looking at a chart on the top, right? That's, I call it the external. That's your external view. If everyone was a, everyone could look at a chart, and if everyone could look at a chart without looking at anything that's happening underneath, um, then why would they even, you know, they're all be geniuses. It doesn't work like that. This is a world where traditional technical analysis is turned over its head because of the machines. I cannot emphasize to you how important it is, the power and understanding how the algo, uh, the algo HFT programs work. So this is externals. The internals, in my opinion, are really where the key is. The simple analogy is when you go to a doctor, you've heard this in, before in my videos and people have heard this before. He looks at you and he says, okay, I know, you know, you have red eyes and, you know, maybe you're sniffing and whatever and you're sick. They know that. They don't know if there's something really wrong with you and what they need to do. That's your blood test and all the internal tests that are done. Internals are key. The internals are MACDs, the stochastics, the vortex indicators, McClellan oscillators, um, you name it. There are hundreds of different internals you can use. Money flows, OBV, on balance volume. RSI, relative strength index, you guys know it. But reading the internals in a volatile market really requires skill. And I believe that I develop on that every single day. In the past year, these markets have taught me more. And what has taught me most is never to be scared. Doesn't mean I don't feel crappy on certain days because I have a short position and it's not working for about five hours. Sure, but you know what? That's just the way it is. So let's look at the basic internals here. Volume's important, yep, you can look at that. But another thing I wanna warn people is that, hi, who just joined right now? Hi, Lynn, how are you? Okay, a little late, but you can pick up from here. So basically, um, Lynn, can you hear us? Lynn, can you hear us? Lynn Rishin, can you hear us? Okay, I'll continue. So. Let's look at the uh, the volume part. People say, hey, there was light volume and stuff. So what? Almost 40 to 50%, 40 percent of volume, if not more, on some of the, uh, in a lot of stocks, are being traded in dark pools. What are dark pools? They're private exchanges between large investment banks and their private exchanges in large investment banks and, um, excuse me one second, I'm just checking something here. Okay, there are private exchanges between large investment banks and all kinds of uh, privately traded stuff that, that we don't know uh, what the volume is there. The external volume that you're looking at the external volume that you're looking at is just external volume, things that are going over the public exchanges. So the volume doesn't always give you the great, greatest picture like it used to. In the old days, a lot of traditional analysts, technical analysts, and they were good. They were very good. They said price and volume. That's all that matters. It doesn't work like that anymore, in my opinion. And I've shown that repeatedly. So let's. So it's important, especially futures volume. That's a different story. <laughs> When you watch the futures volume, you can actually read a lot of tea leaves because that's where the real gamblers are playing. The E-minis, 
on the S&P, the NASDAQ E-mini, I mean, the NASDAQ uh, uh, futures, all that type of contract. Those are things that you can watch on your screen and those can tell you a different story. So let's take a look at this hourly chart and what am I seeing? I am seeing the one hour stochastics not yet fully oversold. Not a good sign. That means we're coming down. That means we're coming down. Futures, by the way, right now just plummeted nine again. So let's take a look at the same story on the one hour on the actual futures chart. One hour. And I can't even tell you how much money this these things have made for me. So looking at the e-minis, because the e-minis, by the way, are active. They're live. Remember the previous chart that I showed you? It's a static chart from Friday. Futures are down 950 right now to 1909.75. The general rule of the thumb is for the new people that the e-minis you have to add about seven. Okay, you need to, uh, somebody is moving their microphone around, so please, you know, keep that low. Uh, the E-minis, you have to add like six, seven, eight points, depending, you know, um, in order to get the value of the S&P 500. So 1910, basically where we are right now, 1909, is around 1916 or so, let's put it that way, on an actual S&P number. Remember, S&Ps are not the ones trading, it's the contracts behind them trading, right? Everyone's clear on that, correct? So looking at this here, one hour chart that we saw on Friday at, uh, one second here, on Friday at, we closed, Friday we closed here, roughly around uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock Friday. This is it now. So we are getting oversold, and this is one thing very important. A lot of resets, these are called internal resets. Because the machines are, they don't give, they don't care about companies. They don't care. They are just moving on price. They are moving on, 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 on technicals. That's how they're programmed. Okay. So the point is, the point is that they are right now starting to get oversold. Look at that. They are not fully oversold yet. Look at the hammer here. That's the inverted hammer. There's a lot of stuff going on here, so I can spend like you know three hours explaining that, and uh, you be you be, I'll be happy to do that as I continue with uh, with my sessions with people. Um, right now, optimal buying conditions are when we go on the stochastics for people who use the think or swim. On the e minis, which is around, look at on the right hand side. Around two. We're at nine, right? We are at eight. 8.72. So overnight, we could go down, S&P points could go down maybe, right now we're down 11 points. And I'm sure there's news breaking uh, on the front and um, on uh, maybe China news and stuff, but I'll look at that in a second. Um, and this is where we are. So once we get down to, if the market opens down 20 points tomorrow, is it time to really freak out? No. I will be monitoring what my internals are telling me and I will basically at that point decide to go long. Remember, this is a very volatile market. You have to keep your trades close to your vest. It doesn't mean you have to be a five minute trader, but you cannot also rely on any predictable saying, okay, we're down, so we'll be up by Wednesday. No. It all depends on the technicals and the internals and what they're telling us. I just want to warn people on that. Swings are fine and good from very deep oversold conditions. I love those. But we are not at deep oversold conditions yet. We might get there by tomorrow or maybe by Tuesday. So he, if once we get down to with these deep oversold levels, which are around negative 0.03, you can see that on the right, or around 2, just anywhere there visually, down towards zero, they are great buying opportunities every single time. Sometimes they're fake out. Sometimes they'll go up, go, they'll go up a little bit, then fail at the, at the 20 level. This is a relative strength, actually. Remember, the RSI level, 20 and 80. 
there's an old saying, sell over 80, buy below 20. Okay? So how much below 20 do you buy is, look, we can't go below zero. So once you hit that, you start to get developments of a short covering rally. It's a lot of money to be made of those. We know that. Okay? We know that. So here at this point in live action, you are seeing these things starting to get oversold. So that's number one. The number two is, another thing I look at, is the McClellan Oscillator. The McClellan Oscillator is a screaming buy where it's almost like 80% probability you're going to make some serious money. You're going to hold your nose, you're going to buy, and you're going to make some serious money over the next trade, uh, 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 either the same trading day or over the next 24 hours. Is when the McClellan Oscillator goes to minus 500. It doesn't happen too often. When the McClellan Oscillator went to minus 300, I'm going to show you guys something here. Okay? Let me get my big highlighter minus almost minus 300 look at this look at this once it gets to those levels nobody wants to buy and then my famous line the pain of sacrifice is worse than the pain of regret guess what you miss out on some of the biggest money that can be made on the long side so looking at the Ms. McClellan right now on the daily remember this is the daily Everyone can see the screen, correct? Great. It's actually quite easy when you look at it. What's the hardest part is during the day while the process... Thank you. When the process is happening, it's nerve-wracking. Not to me. Am I uncomfortable a lot of the times? Absolutely. That's why I scale in. I never jump in. Everyone says, what's a great point to buy? There are no great points to buy. There are no great, there are no perfect moments, my famous line. You gotta tactically, hold on one second, please. Sorry about that. So what you do is you got to scale in. You buy, let's say we're talking about fast trading. Let's talk about fast trading for high volatile market, fast trading, okay? So you buy something at eight. I will start off at eight. It slips down. Yes, you can put a stop loss, but what's a stop loss in a volatile environment? Let me ask you that question. It's good because you protect your capital, but in an in environment where things are getting reset, and I know things are going to bounce because it got that deeply oversold. Why should I try to jump in and out knowing very well that I'm going to miss the trade? So if, if, if I'm not saying hold from 8 to 1, and I'm not telling anybody how to manage their trades. That's not my business. Okay? Just very clear about that. So if this goes to, let's say, uh, goes to 5, I buy more. Slips to 4. So I'm not feeling good here. So there's a 50% reduction in my principal at that point. But I'm buying small lots at a time. And it's happened. And I'm giving you my personal thing. What, I'm not saying I do this. Remember, I'm a very flexible trader. And I'll change my rules at any given time. But I'm just telling you. So I'm seeing things getting really oversold here. And everyone's just freaking out. This is the end of the world. They know the bear market started at 2 p.m. August 24th garbage so basically this goes to let's say i'm giving you extreme scenarios goes to one this is going to be the point where it's going to be like this so at this point i add my highest number of calls if i'm expecting a bounce based on what i'm seeing just the way i did on friday did i expect three dollar calls on friday the last lot that i bought around three Go to 24? <laughs> Absolutely not. I can lie and say, yeah, I knew. Then I'm an idiot. And I'm not. Because my service is not about giving you false hopes and all kinds of stuff. It's very tactical, very straightforward. But I knew we were going to bounce. On Friday, 
on the puts because I expected the market to come down. So on the same thing on the long side. So this is the point between one and four is when I'm going to add my most aggressive levels based on my reading of what the internals are and if it's a real panic situation. Am I going to be right all the time? No. Am I going to be right most of the time based on my track record? Yes. Because by that time, my cost basis is going to be low. It's going to be probably three. So I don't need much of a bounce. If this bounces to six, I just doubled my money. And it happens a lot in volatile markets. So yes, protect your principal using stops. But don't go in at this one time in a fast market. And if you're looking for a perfect point when it's just going to be like, oh, wow, it's cheap. This is the time. Yes, perfect points only come at point of maximum fear like this. Like this. And then interim while we were trading in this band in the 2000, if you remember, this was the this was the previous band that the market was trading in. Let me get this. Before we broke down, before we broke down below 2030, 2040, actually 2040 or so, then this was the level of the McClellan oscillators, which was around minus 200. So at this point, getting towards these extreme levels of minus 300, minus 400 is rare. But when it does happen, for God's sakes, you can almost assure a big fat bounce. Anything can change, but that's just the way it goes. Now, this is a daily chart. So when I'm looking at the daily chart, the McClellan is in no man's land right now. I would love to see the McClellan down at minus 100. So let's study the daily chart for a minute here. Is the McClellan same as the NIMO? Yeah, that's the New York Stock Exchange McClellan oscillator. And that's the same as the NIMO, correct. So um, they look different when you're looking at stock charts and when you're looking at, uh, uh, when you're looking at uh, what do you call it, um, think or swim. That was a question from Guru. Good question. So I like the stock charts more because they're real time. So stochastics look at this on the daily right now. Futures are down 12 points. So the thing that I want to remind everyone, always have cash on the site. Doesn't matter what the size of your account is. You got to have cash on the site. That's where you can act on and wipe out your losses on things that you might be holding and not going in your direction. Believe me when I tell you. So looking at the daily chart here, we would love to see the stochastics. I'm back to the stochastic chart. Back towards this minus, this 0.13 or minus 06 level. Is that clear with everyone? It's very clear here. This is the level, this is what, you know, this is since, this, since the change of market character, right? On August 19th. If you look at this in a simple way, simple, you want it to come down and test this level. And it's heading there. It's not there yet. It's not there yet. All right? Just want to be clear about that. That is the point of maximum profit. But it is also the point of maximum risk. It's the point of maximum fear. So just keep that in mind. So let's take a look of the chart of the market on a daily basis over since since the market correction and pullback change in character, whatever you call it. So this is what I think is being played out. I've told you that this was this October low is most probably going to get tested. And to be honest with you, to drop from here to here is about 70 points, right? 70 points. So that's about another. 500 to 550 points on the Dow. Be prepared for it. Now, if everybody's thinking the same way, the market's just not going to do it. That's just the way it works. It'll blast the shorts. Major support at the 1890 level or so. At that point, you could also draw a... You could do this. Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is major support. Is it possible that it slips 
and gets towards the lower acceleration band about 1850, which is basically here. That was the third day, the 26th, when the market turned. Huge money was made here, huge money. And I can assure you that more than 90% of traders, as I love saying, were not involved in the trade. Big move, 600 point move in the market from the 24th, um, from the 26th till the 28th. So that's one one uh, thing scenario that's played out, being played out. And the other one is that uh, it, uh, it, it cracks below here, all hell breaks loose and we come down and, and rest on the acceleration band. In my opinion, unless we have another flash crash, and flash crashes happen once a year, guys, just letting you know. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. Then we're not gonna move that, that quickly towards that bottom uh, in one single day. And in which case, it's a great buying opportunity, in my opinion. So let me draw a line. There. I don't know why this red is looking pink. Don't ask me. It's supposed to be red. Maybe it's a pink kind of market. I don't know. Um, this is still red. So maybe Think or Swim is, you know, going for the pink look now. Um, so anyway, what we have here. Um, okay. So I think I've, I've, uh, I've beaten the drum on this one. So you guys are pretty aware of what's going on. So a move down here towards 1890 or so, 1898 on your E-minis, on your futures, futures chart. Everyone has does have access to futures charts, right? On their platform, if they want to take a look at it. Yes. Yes or no? Does everyone have access to futures charts? Yes. Okay. That's one person. Does anyone have not have access to futures charts? I have futures. No, I know. Anyone who, who does not have access to futures charts. So everyone has access to futures charts, correct? All right. Yes. So then I'll tell you straight out. Use them. Get friends. Get to learn how to read the futures chart. It'll take a little while, but believe me, I'll tell you, it'll sh tell you more how to manage your trades better than anything else ever will. That's just the way it is. So just letting you guys know. So anyway, so 19, uh, 1898, 1900 in the futures, which is like another eight S&P points down. So if you add that to where we are right now, that means if we opened out 20 points tomorrow, you will get a quick reversal bounce, which will be monitored for overbought conditions, whether overbought conditions on the hourly. Let me move on to the hourly now. If the hourly over, uh, oversold conditions, which are developing as we are conducting this session, okay, and we come down towards 1900, where we bounce from on Thursday, use that as an opportunity to buy, in my opinion. I will, of course, be monitoring everything else around, but this would be, a, in my opinion, a good buying opportunity, in which case the futures would be down to 1900 and we would be opening down 20 points tomorrow, which means that Dow will be opening up, opening down 120 points and CNBC and, and Bloomberg will be like, oh Lord, here comes another bloody Monday, all kinds of garbage, and you're gonna see this, this turn. This will turn rather rapidly. Whether or not it turns like this, like it did on Thursday, I don't know. But even a minor turn can translate into real decent profits, as you all very well know. So that's your thing on the on the E minis. Let me pull let me pull up this um, SPX right now. So here's a picture of the SPX on the daily. And looking at this pattern here, this is a daily. S&P 500 chart. Okay, remember, the E-minis will look a little bit different on the internal than the SPX. On the SPX, you have the, you, this is obviously the, 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 the uh, October lows from last year. One way I draw the lines, just so you know. Now, oh, they really changed these colors around. One second. So you got this line here, and this was the waterfall drop. Pattern symmetry. People know that from what I've taught before. Does occur in nature, it occurs in trading. 
one of the things I'm noticing is that we have we have uh, we seem to be holding these lows. 1900 is a magnet. I would love it to get to 1900 before we wake up tomorrow morning, because then we would have created this pattern. And I believe that holds for now. What does that mean? We're going to just bounce up to, to 2000? No, but this trading band will come into play. This trading band will come into play. A breakage of 1900 will immediately drop us another 20 S&P points. That's roughly another 160 Dow points. If we test this, great. Here is one thing that you guys all have to be aware of. The Dow Jones Industrial Average and other indices have tested the October 2014 lows. The S&P 500 has not. I don't know why. There are components in there that's holding it up. Okay, so this retest of 1820 from last year is also a possibility. Is everyone clear on that? Is everyone clear on that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So just remember that, and you hear commentators talk that, and they're correct. It's not going to happen in one go. To get down to 1820 will require some real heavy-duty selling. Maybe a pre-announcement from another Caterpillar type of company. Maybe a pre-announcement from Intel. Some of the old Dow stalwarts. Maybe a pre-announcement from Hewlett Packard. Maybe a pre-announcement from Apple. Oh boy, forget that. Then we're talking real meltage. Um, maybe a pre-announcement from um, Enron. Well, we already know. They're in the crapper. Exxon, I mean, sorry, Enron, I said. Um, maybe a pre-announcement from Goldman Sachs, talking some big names, which can affect the market on the heavy side, on the Dow Jones side of that. Then we are seeing these things happen. In the interim, 1900 would be great, and a retest of the acceleration band here and the lower Darvis. Remember, when you see my charts, and I'm going to show this very quickly for everyone to remind, I have three platforms that I use. I use Thinkorswim, I use freestockcharts.com, and over the past couple of months, two months or so, I've been using very effectively TradingView, which are very clean to see. And then I have my special charts, which I call the Algo HFT pivot charts. Those are another day session because those are beautiful. They and every little candle gives me an opportunity to make money. And they are really, they, 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 I don't, they, uh, they're truly Algo charts, as I, I, in my opinion. But they really move in a different fashion and give me much early signals than some of these. These are great too, but those really, and those are the ones you have seen many times on my Twitter feed. And they are, um, if people can't remember what they are, I would say, I'm trying to find one for you guys. Hold on. Trying to find one for you guys. One second. Oops. You are familiar with what I'm talking about, right? The Algo HFT charts. Some of you don't. I mean, some of you guys. Well, the people who have been with me, you know what I'm talking about, right? No? Yes or no? Yes. I need, I need some response. Okay. Please, this is it. One second. These ones are just beautiful. They're really unbelievable. Thursday close off here. Friday open. They were up here. Review my Twitter feed. You love these. I normally try to put the term algo HFT. So whenever you see bar chart, you know those are the algo pivot charts. These are all the lines that I draw. The automatically draw, uh, uh, generated lines are obviously the Bollinger Bands, the wave, the green lines are the resistances, the yellow line. Where is the yellow line here? Is the pivot? This one, actually. This one right there, pivot. And then the red lines are the supports. Very clear. 
okay? Red line is the support. And I draw lines over it. And believe me when I tell you, and I will certainly take credit for this one, okay? They are very precise the way I draw them. And I wish I could show this to you guys every five minutes, but that's not humanly possible. So these are when I, this downtrend line, for example, from the from the from uh, when when the spies were two eleven and the and the S and P was over twenty one hundred before the breakdown. Um, that's the downtrend line, the red line. Once it gets to what's that? That's major resistance. Look how many times it's hit it and failed. Then there's a falling wedge, which I highlighted to you guys, and it made some decent money on fr on on the, on the Friday open. And then by Friday, uh, this was uh, so this was September 25th. It was Friday, yeah. Um, then this was the Thursday close. So by the time Friday came, this was all overbought. I've showed that many times. They were all overbought. And 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 I refused to, you know, I believe that the market was going to pull back. And once you hit, let's remember things you read. Re chart reading. Once you hit upper Bollinger, this is the mid Bollinger, this line. I'm sorry, that's the 30, 40 moving average, the orange line, this one. Every time you're hitting resistance lines and hitting a downtrend line and you're overbought, guys, you're going to make a crap load of money buying small bits off the puts on the S&P, on the NASDAQ, on the RUT, on the Russell 2000, which is a little bit different, by the way, the way it acts, because it's affected by oil and biotechs mostly. But the SPIs are the best ways. Remember, you don't need that many instruments to make money. You're going to get a 50, 60, 70%, 100%, and 1,200%, for God's sakes, you know, but that's, a, that's an aberration, okay? Um, on the S&Ps, then why the hell do you have to look anywhere else? I don't like shorting individual stocks that much other than Netflix here and there. Tesla here and there. You know why? Can somebody give me a reason why? Somebody give me intelligence. Why you don't want to short? Why? No, that's not the question. The question is why is it risky to short certain individual stocks, powerful individual stocks, which might be coming down in a in a downward sloping market? Short covering, anything can happen. That's right. Because how many times has it been that in the middle of a very red day in the market that news has come out on Tesla, news has come out on Netflix, and has blown the cover out of the shorts? Prime example was when we bought Netflix and made like big time points the other day after it was net net short on that stock. You're absolutely correct. Individual stocks carry a certain amount of risks, both on the upside and the long side, that are not that are not um, on the actual indices. I look for simple ways to make money, not complicated ways. I don't do complicated strategies. I don't do all kinds of wild condors and stuff because I'm stupid. Yet my ROI is higher than most of the guys out there. Because the way I look at it is a straight out, and you can do spreads and stuff, no question about it. You can do straddles. You can you know, do that stuff. But doing, in my opinion, this is, this is just the clueless way of doing things. Okay, I'm not asking anyone to subscribe to it. Is getting too complicated on a trade strategy will take your focus away from overall what's going on. I am, in my opinion, um, a far better chart reader and market forecaster than anyone out there. And I'm learning every day and I'm improving every day. So if I'm going to capitalize on it, I'm going to play the straight indices. Just letting you guys know. So that's why that's why I, I, um, um, I, I do the straight indices. And this other thing to keep in mind and very simple, simple reason, right? Uh, with uh, with uh, the SPX or any of the indices going long or short, okay, on the options. Is they're moving. If the market's down, they'll be down. If the market's up, they'll be up. So it's almost a guarantee. That's the only guarantee is that they'll swing with the market. Is that simple explanation uh, understandable to everyone? Yes? yes. Okay. Yep. Because there, there, I'm not saying that you can short stocks. You can short Apple and stuff, but then what? Apple comes comes out with a news announcement that they sold a million more phones and whatever. You're going to get blasted out. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm simply saying that you carry more risk. You carry more risk by uh, by uh, um, uh, 
trying to short certain individual stocks because honestly speaking, it's a fast moving market and all kinds of stuff can happen. I'll stick to the indices. So here, here is your, your daily on that. Let me just quickly show you what's happening with the techs. So daily chart, not good. Is it that bad? No. You know, can anyone tell me why it's not that bad? This is the NASDAQ technology where all our big wigs hang out, right? The Apples, the Netflixes, the Pricelines, the Googles, the Amazons. Why is this not a bad chart? Please give me a simple answer. This is a daily chart. I'm waiting. And while I'm waiting, I'll draw a few things on it. But um, somebody, 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 please fix the microphone. Either they're falling over the chair or they're just too excited. Um, yeah, I don't know which one. But uh, while I'm while I'm doing that, now who said uh, who answered first one? Is it Nia? Yeah. Okay, can, can I get some answers from some other people too? I'm being serious. I mean, there are many reasons why it's not a bad chart, but I'm just asking, what is, the, what is one of the glaring things that shows up that it's not a bad chart? Okay, I'm gonna call names, Guru. Guru, you yeah, got... I can see. Um, sto... Tell yeah, me. I can see the stochastics is oversold. Um... That's the answer, like Nia said originally. When you look at simple stuff here, thank you for answering. Okay, okay. this is the simplest way to play it. Now look what's going on here. This is known as a massive positive divergence. Massive, not like a little one. We were down to 85 on the Qs, correct? On the day of the crash. Okay, clear on that? We went down to zero. We are almost at zero. We are at 103 on the indices, on the, on the QQQ. What is this called? It's called a monster positive divergence. You can only lose nine points here very quickly, and it's probably doing that right now on the NQs. I'll show you that. And Qs of the NASDAQ futures. So we are getting deeply oversold on the daily while the levels are way higher. We got a 20 point positive divergence. I want everyone to be clear about this and understand positive divergence because they have done tremendously well for me, both negative and positive divergences, mind you. Here's a 20 point differential. Okay? Almost a 20 point differential, okay? Yet the internals are almost at the same level. In other words, we are getting oversold, yet the price refuses to come down to 85. Are you guys, did, did I want people to understand this. What is this telling us? How do you interpret it? This is the way you interpret it, guys, okay? The way you interpret it is that, and this is the game theory part comes in, is that tech earnings for the third quarter that ends on September 30th is going to be a lot better than what people or the bears are expecting. That's what it means. For this to collapse down to August 24th levels, you need a catastrophic pre-warning from the likes of Apple and the others on that. So my read is that given this positive divergence, a 20-point positive divergence, and we are getting this deeply oversold, which we'll do that by tomorrow morning if we open here, I think. It's telling us that techs are strong.
that the leaders on the tech side are going to deliver numbers that are going to be much better than what the pessimists are saying. Am I clear on that? Am I clear on that? Yes. Anyone who, who didn't understand that, feel free to ask me because this is money in your pocket. I'm not kidding. This is serious money in your pocket if you understand what I'm saying. Anyone not understand it? That there's a massive internal positive divergence and an external positive divergence on the daily, on the, on the, on the cues. Now, if I change this to IWM, which is a Russell 2000, does it look like a positive divergence? Please, somebody answer me. Does this look like a positive divergence, yes or no? How about, how about I give you I a hint? I don't think so. To me, it doesn't. It looks like stochastics wants to go down. One second. This. I'm going to show you this picture. Okay? This is, uh, actually, I'll show you from the 24th. Nope. It, it, the, the, the chart gets too stretched out, so I'm sorry. One second. Let me just make this a little bit clearer. I want people to understand this because they will manage their trade so much better. This is here, and we are almost down here. That is a positive divergence. Everyone clear on that, correct? Yeah. Positive Div. When I was to, when I used to, I'm going to move down to the uh, spies right now, IWM right now. When I used to post these charts on stock twists, and I still do, but back in 2011, like people used to go, who is this guy? And he comes up with this stuff, and it actually goes there. And I've obviously learned a lot more and refined my abilities to read the market, but a lot of it was purely playing upon understanding the positive and negative divergence of the internals. They work like magic. So this is it. So I am going to do this chart now from the 20, let's say from here. Does this in any way or form look like a positive divergence? Please no. try to remember the chart I just showed you. And then look at this chart. Does, let me just walk you guys through. Does this chart look very different? Guru? So yeah, I, 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 no, I don't. I'm getting oversold, but. Uh, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Does this chart look different than the QQQs that I showed you? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, does this chart look different? than the one I showed you on the QQQs just a minute ago. Jeremy, can you can you type in or, or one second? I'm sorry. Jeremy said yes. Okay, KJS. <coughs> KJS, you there? Yes. Okay, Lynn? Lynn, are you there? Type in yes or no. Does this chart look different than chart doesn't look different? No. Okay. Um, Mary. Uh, not much different from the first chart from the QQQs. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nia. Um, I say yes. It looks different. Good. Paris. Paris. Okay. And Trina. Trina? Trina, are you there? Okay. The answer is yes. It does look different. It looks quite different. I'm going to pull this. I'm going to put the QQQ. And I'm going to do this. It's fundamentally different. This has a much, there's a, I repeat, there's a 20-point differential between the lower Darvis, August 24th, 
and where we are right now, while the internals are that deeply oversold. Let's do the same metrics on the Russell 2000. Let's do the same metrics on the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 has a differential of two points, three. Well, of course, different metrics on that side, but still, this is fundamentally a different chart than that. For actual, I mean, technically, a very different chart. Look at that. Very different chart. This is a bearish engulfing. Even though they're getting oversold here, certainly an opportunity very soon when oil will bounce. And um, this is a different looking chart. What it's telling you, in my opinion, is that the subcomponents of the Russell 2000, and look it up yourself, lots of biotechs, lots of uh, uh, energy companies, natural gas companies, gold miners, you name it, lots of small companies, okay, especially on the commodity side, are going to deliver horrific numbers. Despite the fact we already know they're going to deliver horrific numbers. That's the reason why the fundamental reason that drives market, which is earnings, tech is going to be the bright shining winner in the whole game. You heard it here first. Just letting you know. So this is a different looking chart. Now, if I put this, if I put a spy here, which has a mixture of a lot of other things, the spy actually has a pretty decent positive diversion. Look at that. The best one is the Qs. That's what I'm getting at. So the tech is where I'm going to play most of my bets during earnings season. And you know I do the earnings plays uh, and use different strategies to do it. So just keep that in mind. That's a little bit of a forecast from what I'm seeing out here and based on what's going on out there. Now, let me show you a couple of other things. And then we're going to... One second. Uh -huh. Lots of things happening on this, but I wanted to show you something. Uh, can you mute your microphone, please, Lynn? Daily chart. I want to show you a little, uh, a little daily chart with my channels and stuff on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And uh, I think this will be helpful to you. Lynn, can you? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just mute everyone. Lynn, can you mute your microphone, please? Okay. So, sorry, one minute. Please. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So this is a, this is known as a uh, expanding megaphone. Expanding megaphones have different traits. I'm not going to get into each one of them right now, but this is the way you read this chart because you'll be seeing a lot more wedges, par lines, all kinds of stuff, and uh, and you'll see how 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 precise they are. It's already in motion. So here are the couple of things you guys are going to watch. Expanded megaphone at the bottom. Guess where it coincides with? Bingo! Right here. Expanded megaphones are joined by joining the declining tops, and the acceleration, you know, uh, these uh, right there. That's how you draw them. Anyway, um, so the lower end of the megaphone happens to be the lows of the 25th of August, which is around 15,650. Everyone clear on that? So where, where do we close that? We close the 16,315. 16,315. I'm going to give you exact points. You can write these down. Believe me. Uh, and this is 15,650. Difference is 665 points. Ladies and gentlemen, we could have a 665 point drop between now and uh, um, I would say October, mid October, and then you just can ramp up like nobody's business. I don't want to use any New York terms either. Okay. However, there are ways along the way. It's not going to be easy. We have a, let me walk you through this chart here. I know Guru and all these guys, they know how to read this, but uh, I will walk people through it. You have this line here where I have a red arrow. It's a Bollinger. Want to know what this color looks like? Bollinger band. We have a narrowing Bollinger band. See that? It's getting narrow, known as a pinched Bollinger. In my opinion, the first thump the market's going to get is 16,000. The market will test 16,000, in my opinion. Again, you can see the reversal tail here on this, uh, on this uh, candle. Okay, and guess what the reversal tail was? Off this channel, 
See the red lines, these channels, which I drew. So the reversal tail is of this candle, I mean of this channel. It refused to enter the channel. If it had entered the channel, you would have a failure at this line here, which is the upper end of the trading band. That's 16,700. That's how you read this chart. The lower end of this trading band is the lower Bollinger and this line here, which is 16,000. Simple math. We're in a 700 point trading band on the Dow on a weekly basis. That's called volatility, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get 700 points up or down, and you will very well get that. Okay? And nothing changes. We have downward sloping 50 and 34 day moving averages. The market trend has been broken for now on the daily. These are fast moving downward sloping 50 and 30 day moving um, 34 day moving averages. Any movement above the 34 will hit resistance at the downward sloping 50. Watch it on your on your charts, on your own screens. Unless we have a massive move up and break over the red line here, the channel, and enter above this yellow line, which is 17,050 or 17,100, these lines are not going to turn. It's known as a breath thrust. I have a tough time saying that word. It takes my breath away. Okay? A breath thrust is like a big punch to the upside. Unless we have a move above this channel here, or let's call it 17,000, the trading band, this pattern, unfortunately, will not come to play, which is 17,400. At this point, I am looking at a retest of 16,000 on the Dow. Worst case scenario, 15,650. You have another line here, which is basically the acceleration band, which is very similar to where, where we, you know, where we're going to bounce. So that's just the way you're going to read this chart. This line here should be actually drawn a little bit more tighter. Hold on. And then I'm going to open up for a couple of quick questions. So this is where we are. Okay. So we hit, look how beautiful how these charts are drawn. You've got, the yellow line is important for traders. It's a five-day moving average. You'd like the five-day moving average to be trending up. We hit the five-day moving average and we had a sort of reversal tick, a running tail. Not necessarily that bad. Internals are telling you we need more to get. We have already covered internals quite a bit today, so you guys understand that. So let's look at the charts here. So lower end of the Bollinger will act as support at 16,448. So that means another 300 points or so that we need to, you know, we need to travel. Now, all that bearish talk gets out of the way if we turn around and enter this channel in force. If we do that, simple. We're going to go up 400 points to the top of this. Don't be a hero at this level sell be smart unless we completely break out and go bur you know like hog wild up here it can happen believe me it can happen i'm telling you in this market it's very oversold overall after it gets there so and people are it's just you know cash levels are at levels we have not seen since 2008 it's really like crazy stuff going on there everybody's scared so the point is that uh, <clears throat> this happens, then we are going to basically, um, we're basically going to, at that point, just burst loose and get to that 17,000 level. So I'm going to be updating these charts as we go along, and you guys will understand. But this is how you read my charts, I mean, some of them. So you got to follow the lines, got to follow the Bollingers, the channels that I draw. These channels were not drawn for fun. They are serious channels. And if you notice, it went into it and it fell back out of it. It needs to go inside here so that it can get to the top of this uh, band, which is 16,700. If we're going to get 400 points in the Dow, let's capture 300 of that in our books. Okay, fair enough. So in, in summary, what I'm getting at is we are, just like everyone knows, I don't need to tell anyone, that if we make big bets on one side or another, we are going to die. We need to be moderate, to small and it small gets big 
if you normally buy, you know, I'm just giving you an example. Let's say normally you buy 5,000 shares of something. In this type of environment, buy 1,000, buy 500. Because things will change so fast. And I will always be there to, to let people know. But don't expect great things or terrible things. Just expect Algo, HFT, and Clueless A charts trying to determine that before that happens. So my uh, uh, suggestion is that we can make a very decent sum of money. Last week we did. But don't carry too many large overnight positions. I repeat that over and over again because we really don't know what's going to happen at 4 in the AM, 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time when European markets open. So I don't care what you think about a certain company, what you think of this and that. We are in a very tricky period of the market where you have to manage your trades tightly. Doesn't mean you have to sell every time the market you know, goes up 100 points, but all I'm saying is you have to know. So that's my opinion. That's what I stand with. I'll leave this open for a couple of quick questions if anyone wants to look at a chart or two, um, and then we're going to wrap up because it's 9 o'clock. Go ahead. Could you look at IBB? Sure. I was actually thinking of that. One second. Okay. Here's a daily of the IBB. All right. And it looks like a, a it looks like those icicles in uh, thing. Let me just move all the all the all the pictures here. Okay. First glance. First glance. Oh, what a bad chart. Like, oh, my God, you know, the world is ending. You know, nobody's going to care about cancer drugs anymore, and it's just going to be the end of the world. And Hillary, who's not even going to be, looks like the way things are going, the president of the United States is going to basically demolish the biotech industry. Hogwash. IBB right now is going to bounce. It's going to bounce hard. And let me tell you why. And I'm just speaking from my experience, all right? And you know the same stocks you got to get into. The fastest moving ones, ICPT, Regeneron, Biogen. Just stick to two or three because those are the first ones they'll buy. On a, on a daily basis, we are getting there. We're not completely there yet. Here is what's happening, which I find it to be extremely positive. And thank you for bringing it to my attention, okay? We are way out of the Bollinger and the acceleration band. Whenever you get that type of situation, and forget about August 24th, I'm talking just in general, very seldom do you fall out of these trading bands. What does that tell you? When you fall out, out of trading bands, and what are the trading bands? Bollinger bands, acceleration bands, okay? So when you fall out of trading bands, what is it telling you about human behavior? Or about that sector. Panic. Panic selling. Panic. Exactly. Complete capitulation. This is massive. It's panic selling. Yeah, it's panic selling and capitulation. It does not mean that there's no reason. Maybe there's a shift in sentiment by large fund managers on what's happening on the biotech side. That the valuations are too high. I don't know that. All I know is on a short-term basis as a tactical trader, when you see capitulation like this, you need to be a buyer instead of a seller for a simple reason. The IBD will try, uh, the IBB will uh, try to bounce back, at least test this uptrend line from way back and at least get back inside the Bollinger and the acceleration band. 310. It will at least try to get back to a 324. And you know what the stocks will do. At least test the five, the downward sloping uh, moving average, 330, around that level. Is it possible that it gets here first before it does that? It is possible. It is possible. So I'm not going to you know, say. However, any time, and I've said this before, you fall that hard out of the Bollinger and the acceleration bands, you will get a mean reversion trade that's going to just blow people's mind out and they'll say, oh, crap, I missed it again. The mean reversion trade is what I'm showing you here. I am not saying the general trend, which is certainly on the downside, 
unless we break out over 360 again, in which case it will be a dragon bullish. But short term, it will try to get back to some level of sanity, and that is basically up here. Is it possible? And look at the me. Uh, look at this here. The standard deviation right now from the 50 and the 34 day moving average is probably around um, minus three. I'm just giving you a visual around minus three. It's three. It's basically you know 300 basis points away from the th from the 34 and the 50 day moving average. This was almost seven. Just so you know that. Just like the market during the crash. So what does normally happen? That right when you think the world is over, then the, the, it has a bounce. So I don't think personally that it can stay out of this Bollinger and acceleration band and get down here. That means the standard deviation is going to be, again, around seven. In which case, screaming by. So here from here, if we get a short term bounce, in my opinion, that's a sell. Because there will be so much panic and fear, like, oh, my God, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a broken sector. You're going to hear all the big shots talking about it like that, you know, the, the typical heads on CNBC, Bloomberg, and you'll see a, you see a fallout. So all short-term stuff, but I believe a sharp bounce is very likely on the IBB at this point. It might not start tomorrow, might start Tuesday, but I'll be watching the daily, and let's take a look at the, year, uh, the hourly. That'll give us an idea. On the hourly, whoa, what was this? Did anyone notice this? I didn't. That's monstrous. Somebody at 355. Nice reversal candle. Yeah, not just that. Look at the volume. That's huge. That's a massive short covering volume. Some smart money decided, mm -hmm. you know, time to go. Time to buy this crap. Enough of Hillary. Seriously. So bottom line is that that you could draw this. I, I did, this is between three three fifty five and four o'clock. By the way, this is an hourly chart between three and four. All buying, all buying, and the reversal candle. Let's do a line. Back in the channel. Want to keep it simple? Want to you know sound like you know wow you know you want to sound like a genius and what you know what you're talking about? It's very simple. Top of the channel. Three twenty five. If this is truly a downtrend, and I don't know, then it's going to hit the top of the channel, and then it's going to go keep on going down, because that's what it does. Is it possible that it doesn't get to the top of the channel and just test this uptrend line? Remember, this is uptrend line that I showed you on the daily, and just fails here? Very possible. So that is what is going on with the IBB. Let's take a picture on the weekly. Let's get a really long-term picture. Whoa. So one second here. All drawings out. Some people might say, oh, my God, this is terrible. No. This is a real correction, 14% from what I heard. This is a real correction. So what's the big deal? Seriously, what's the big deal? So let's look to see the last inflection point on the IBB. And the way you determine it, you guys can all do this together. I mean, yourself, not together, is draw the Fibonacci retracements and look to see where it fell. Whoa, can somebody answer me what I talk about all the time and it's worked like magic? What is a Fibonacci retracement level on a macro longer term swing that is generally considered to be a major buying point? Come on, guys. Somebody has the answer. 50%? Thank you. 50? I say it all. Don't guess. I say it all the time. Is it a 50%? 50 percent correct a 50 percent retracement and i've shown this uh, guru was the one who answered right somebody is writing what card is still showing an ugly drop in front of us showing we will not bottom until april 2000 nice shot said okay yeah th i know McClellan, the, the caught thing, I, I noticed it too but i'm going to ex explain that in a quick second jeremy okay so anyway so um and i agree with that so bottom line is that 50% retracements, 50% retracements are generally standard procedure. You need to cut out 50%. Don't ask me why. I've been doing this for years. And 50% retracements are where things just on a short-term basis stop. Now, this is a weekly chart. Does this mean the worst of the biotech sell-off is over? I don't know. 
but a 50% retracement, I'll take it. Uh, on the weekly, the stochastics, despite this drop, can somebody, and let me see how quickly you guys are picking this up. What is this? Don't tell me that it's a stochastic. I know it's a stochastic. What is this pattern going on? What kind of divergence is going on? Before I draw it, come on, guys. If you're not understanding this, then positive divergence. Thank you. It is. Thank you for stepping up. And everyone should have stepped up on that. I'm serious, guys. It's not rocket science, okay? Rocket science is what my kid does, does in advanced stats. I can't believe this type of stuff they do in, in, in at uh, junior year in school. And he's AP, AP stuff that he takes all the time. It's hardcore. It's going to make us look stupid. This is easy stuff. This is a positive divergence. Thank you for noticing. Because with this type of thump and with this type of volume, I'm not saying that it's not going to come down. But so far, for now, what we see on the weekly, it's still a positive divergence. Do you know how much money I've made of playing these things? And I'm telling you guys, it's wakey time. I'm not saying it's going to go to slip down more and scare the living daylights and test the test the 38.2 Fibonacci retracement. But we got to keep watching this. For now, it's a positive divergence. I showed you on the daily what it's doing. Complete slippage below the Bollinger's and the acceleration band. It is going to try to get back in there. So looking at this chart here, 50% retracements normally should bounce up. Can somebody tell me? And I know you guys have the answer. Can somebody tell me what would be the next logical, um, logical move up? What level? I'm waiting. To the 61? Correct. To three, 324? Four. And guess what? The, you're absolutely correct. When I showed this to you on the daily, didn't I say 320, 325 based on what we saw? That's exactly. Now, that is also the Bollinger. And once it enters the Bollinger, yes. the next level is going to be the 34, I mean, the 50-day moving average on the weekly or the 50-week moving average, which is around 333. The top of the Bollinger, I'm sorry, this is a megaphone. I just drew a megaphone without even thinking about it, okay? So the, top, the, the downtrend line is engaged at around 350 on the IBB. Now, here is the part I find interesting. After all this massive thing here, and I've been, I've, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been following the IBB. I've been very happy with playing my SPXs and stuff when it comes to the indices. But now, thanks to you guys, you know, I'm... I'm really going to focus hard and, and, and we're going to make some serious trades on this side. So saying all that is the downward sloping uh, five week moving average. The yellow line is important. But if we get to the upper end of the megaphone, that's 356. Now, here is what I find interesting. Can somebody tell me what the moving averages are doing? They're pointing up. They're still moving on their merry way up. Exactly. They're not really pointing up. They're starting to curve. Bottom line is the highways haven't collapsed yet. And this is going back to what? Going back to 2014, going back to things. Look, there have been many instances of massive corrections. Look at this massive correction on the IBB, uh, on the biotechs in, uh, uh, from February down to, um, it looks like the end of the world, right? February down to uh, April. See that? Massive correction. Week after week after week after week, similar to this. What did the moving averages tell us? Let me get this thing. Did the moving averages even budge? No. So we could people could have traded this, but long-term players use this as an opportunity to buy. So I'm not saying it's going to be the same thing this time because we don't know. Sometimes it's different. But look what happened here. You see some similarities on the stochastics down to what happened in 2014 and what's happening now? So I don't give, excuse my French, two shits about what these analysts say because they never made me any money. And these BS technicians out there who are either lopsidedly bullish or lopsidedly bearish. But what I'm looking at is my internals. I don't make these up. This is still showing that it is. Look at this correction. And then the, then and move up. So I'm not saying it's broken. It might very well come down here. But at this point, we will have a short-term bounce and it's going to happen. And it's going to be humongous. And then 
if the prime if these lines are really going to turn and they're really going to come down and they really intend to go like this which is a bear market by the way but we won't know that till weeks down the road as long as it, it if it keeps on hitting the 50 and the 34 and failing you can rest assured that the I, that the biotech index nasdaq biotechnology index etf ibb is in a bear market am i clear on that if it keeps on hitting the 50 and the 34 and failing like that obviously it's going to go down a lot more but for now from a tactical standpoint i just showed you the levels from a long term standpoint nothing really has changed other than the ferocity of these charts what is the ferocity of this chart it's machines have re and and, uh, uh, and and a lot of institutions are leveraged in the biotech side and are the biotech companies any of them come out and say hey we're just horrible we're not going to you know we're not panning out we're not meeting our endpoints no i'm not bullish I'm not bearish. I just think there's an opportunity to make some real decent money on this. Now, let me address one last thing here that Jeremy Pester brought out, which has to do with the cot, and I want to get into it right now. That's a euro dollar index, okay, versus uh, thing. And uh, what do you call? Are we showing any ugly drop in front of us? Yes, there is an ugly drop in front of us. Here's my point here. Are you going to sit around today, April 2016, and make no money? Or do you want to go on a long-term short and not look at the market when they're ripping your face off 600-point rallies? So I never quite understood this, and I'll be honest with you. I know that's a good point, by the way. Is um, is uh, uh, I know McClellan quite well, meaning his work, uh, and I do subscribe to that side too, is the fact that we can have big long-term pictures. Does that put any money in our pocket in the short term? No. So if you're going to make a long-term bet that we're going to go down to 14000 on the Dow, which I think we will, Okay, I've shown this to you guys before. Then that's fine. But who's going to feed me in the meantime? That's my question. You can have a long-term picture. I still think the Dow is going to come down and test its breakout level here. Right there. Right there. 14,208. And I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But it's going to happen tomorrow? No. It's probably going to bottom out sometime in 2016. Maybe 2016. I don't know. Can it happen by December? The way markets are, what's a 2,000 point drop, right? We can get it. But what I'm saying is that long-term projections are all fine and good. But when you listen to these macro guys, they, they never make really big money on one side. Yeah, if I have to wait around two years to get a massive correction on the market, so what's the big deal? I'm not going to wait around two years. I'm going to be a tactical trader and an investor, and I'm going to make money on that. Another point I want to bring out to you guys, and I'm going to wrap this up, is the lies that the media spreads. Everyone talks about, because everyone has an agenda, right? Everyone has an agenda when they're talking. They talk about the massive move on the markets from 6,500 to 18,500, right? And the numbers that they gave is what? Like an, basically like a 227% like a, a move on the market. Yes? Correct? This move, what are I talking about? Let me ask you a question here. I never thought of that for a minute. The market actually broke out only in November of 2013. Because that's what the market was. So if you really want to measure the market, how much it's really up, you got to measure it from the breakout level where it was here. And that breakout level is 14,000. So we are up roughly. We went up roughly 4,000 points. From the true breakout level, which is 28.5%. So you can spin it whichever way you want, guys. Okay? But the fact is that this, if this hadn't happened, the market would have been here. So this is a 28% move on the market from here to here. This move was simply reclaiming back chart-wise. It, what it had lost from back in 2007. So when they say, oh, the market just is up 200 some percent and now it's going to go down 100 percent. I don't buy that theory. End of story. So um, thank you for attending the session. I think this was uh, we went for almost two hours. Whoa, well, actually a little less than that. Um, I want um, everyone to be engaged as much as possible. I appreciate all your support and um, 
Thank you. So I hope uh, Paris and uh, and Mr. Pester, I hope that uh, your first advanced coaching session and we cover quite a bit. There's a lot of stuff that I need to cover more. I am just giving a couple of quick reminders. Um, the what do you call it? The SMS a text alert. The company I'm using to set it up. They probably won't be ready by tomorrow, maybe Tuesday. So just letting you know that. Number two, the S and P's have been so successful for me. The options trading, both on an intraday, intra week basis. I'm putting together a course together, uh, and uh, it requires uh, it'll it'll be four sessions. And uh, it'll be live trading too, so you can actually see it live, like how these things are happening, uh, and what you need to do to manage your trades on that stuff. And it'll be a paid session, minimal stuff like I normally do. Uh, but uh, I want everyone to be engaged with that, and I think they'll be fantastic. So that's basically it. Um, everyone, good? Yes, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Anytime, Mary. Look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow and futures are down 850. It's always eight. I wonder why. Just kidding. Uh, get ready for anything tomorrow. Don't get too bearish. Don't get too bullish. Let's see what the technicals are and I'll certainly guide people as, 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 as well as I can. All right. And we'll go from there. Do, do pass on the word to your friend and, you know, bring on some new people on board. Uh, good night. Good seeing you. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye bye.